Good evening and welcome. I'm Ann Walters Robertson, Dean of the Division of the Humanities at the University of Chicago. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the final Dean Salon of the 21-22 academic year. Our Dean Salon series highlights the pioneering research and pivotal breakthroughs of our distinguished faculty. The series explores how the humanities deepen our understanding of the ideas and social forms that shape our lives. This exploration is how we make the work and ourselves ready for change and build a better world. <clears throat> I have the honor of introducing our speakers, but first let me share a very brief overview of the topic they will discuss. We all know that our society as it is now and as it will be in the future is increasingly digital and networked. While our bodies remain rooted in the analog world, our mental, sensorial and social lives increasingly take place over digital platforms. Large swaths of the world population interact socially through the algorithms of social media. Political representation and decision-making are similarly mediated and controlled by digital media technologies. Economies are transformed by the vast amount of data about the needs and desires of consumers that online retail produces. And digitization has reshaped art, culture, and entertainment to a degree that we are only beginning to understand. Through the proliferation of virtual and augmented realities, live streaming and video games, en route to the more recent developments such as NFTs and metaverses. So it's important to ask what all this means for our understanding and for what it means to be human. We'll focus this issue by asking to what extent rapid developments in artificial intelligence can illuminate the human capacity to use language and more broadly shed light on the nature of the human mind. This conversation inherently involves multiple perspectives and disciplines, including disciplines outside the humanities. And I'm so glad we're joined this evening by experts in computer science linguistics, and philosophy. Now, I'm pleased to introduce to you this evening's speakers, Alison Ettinger, Sanjay Krishnan, David Schloen, and Malte Villar. Alison Ettinger is an assistant professor of linguistics, where she works on language processing in humans and in artificial intelligence systems, motivated by a combination of scientific and engineering goals. For studying humans, Allison's research uses computational methods to model and test hypotheses about mechanisms underlying the brain's processing of language in real time. In the engineering domain, she uses insights and methods from cognitive science, linguistics, and neuroscience in order to analyze, evaluate, and improve natural language understanding capacities in artificial intelligence systems. In both of these areas, Allison's primary topic is the representation and processing of linguistic meaning. And I'm very glad we are joined this evening by Sanjay Krishnan, Assistant Professor of Computer Science. Sanjay studies corrupted, missing, or otherwise uncertain data in databases and information retrieval systems. He focuses on studying systems that can give certifiable accuracy guarantees in partially completed databases, query accuracy evaluation in corrupted databases, and automatic detection of data leakage. Moderating our conversation tonight will be David Schloen, professor of Near Eastern Archaeology where he specializes in the archeology span and history of the Levant in the Bronze and Iron Ages around 3500 to 300 BCE. David is also the director of the University of Chicago's program in digital studies of language, culture, and history. 
Before going into archaeology and biblical studies, he studied computer science and cognitive psychology and worked as a computer programmer. David thus has a strong interest in digital humanities and is the ideal moderator for our conversation. And finally, Malte Villar is Associate Professor of Philosophy where he specializes in the philosophy of language and philosophical logic. Malte is interested in how developments in artificial intelligence might inform views of the nature of human cognition, the structure of language, and the foundations of knowledge. And now I'm very excited to turn the virtual podium over to David Schloan. David, take it away. Thank you, Anne, for that uh, very kind introduction. Uh, I'm delighted to be here uh, with all of you, with all of you uh, viewing this uh, webinar and with the panelists with whom I hope to have a, a really illuminating discussion, at least illuminating to me, as I learn uh, more about uh, their own research. I'd like to start by giving a brief overview of some of the key concerns we have before us this evening. And then I'm going to uh, ask each of the panelists in turn, uh, first Sanjay, then Alice, and then Malte, to tell us uh, a little bit about uh, their perspective on uh, tonight's topic, on these questions of AI, language, and the big question, the mind, and what, what do we mean by uh, the human mind? How does that relate to these computational uh, models that we're discussing? So I'll start by noting, as everyone uh, participating here knows, AI is the, um, the buzzword of the decade, of the, the last couple of decades. You can't go anywhere these days without seeing AI, artificial intelligence, mentioned as a branding term, as a marketing term, as a, a description, a shorthand description of all sorts of very impressive computational advances that we'll hear about tonight. And uh, for example, in the New York Times Magazine on uh, April the 15th, just recently, there was a very nice piece on uh, the latest advances in AI uh, using a system called GPT-3. We'll come back to that uh, in a few moments to ask what that's all about, but some rather remarkable achievements in human, human pardon me, not human, but in machine language uh, processing and, um, and uh, computational methods of, um, I won't say understanding, but shall we say working with uh, natural language. The other thing that's obvious to everyone is that language is a defining characteristic of human beings. I mean, I, I don't know many philosophers or anthropologists or others who would really uh, doubt that, that this is a characteristic feature of our species. Uh, so much so that uh, Homo sapiens is often called the language animal, or shall we say, uh, as an archeologist, I would say Homo sapiens having reached the point of having language capacity, whatever, whatever that took in terms of neurological development and evolution, um, we are at least modern homo sapiens uh, have a capacity for language and a use of language which is not found uh, in other species, at least not to the same degree. Third point I wanna make is that as I've mentioned, um, Every year, every few months, we hear about an amazing new feat or achievement by uh, uh, large computational systems using vast amounts of data in order to uh, do things with language uh, that we never might have previously would have thought impossible. Uh, and we'll talk today about what exactly those achievements are and then maybe also a little bit about the uh, current limitations or the continuing limitations and difficulties in developing computational uh, models and systems uh, to handle language. The final thing I would say is that um, from the point of view of scholars in the humanities, certainly, uh, which uh, uh, many of us are on this panel, and I'm, I'm sure many of the people in the audience are interested from that perspective. Um, there's no doubt that computational approaches to uh, modeling intelligence, various kinds of intelligence, 
uh, raise very profound questions about what it is we mean by human intelligence or the mind. I mean, they, they strike, it strikes right to the heart of philosophical debates that have gone on for, I'll say millennia, certainly centuries. And uh, there's a very lively philosophical uh, discussion ongoing and has been for many years, even predating the electronic digital computer about computation, shall we say, or calculation uh, as a model for human cognition, is it or isn't it? And so the latest uh, advances in AI not only provoke uh, some amazement as we see what these machines can do, but they provoke uh, or they return us to some classic questions in philosophy, uh, which we can approach uh, with these new examples in mind. So what I'm gonna do now is uh, ask first Sanjay to say something about his view of the subject. Uh, and to tell us a little bit about how computer scientists understand AI and what it really amounts to from a computational perspective. I should add that when I did a degree in computer science uh, many years ago, the courses in artificial intelligence were all about the explicit representation of human knowledge in a computer and automated reasoning using logical methods. But uh, as I understand it, that's not what we mean now by AI usually. We're referring to something called statistical machine learning and uh, computational models involving so-called neural networks with huge amounts of input data. So Sanjay, could you give us maybe a high level description of what AI means to a computer scientist? Absolutely, and I'm just so happy that I'm on this panel. I think this is a great opportunity to sort of share some of the insights from computer science, share some of the insights from the humanities and sort of get a global understanding of what this phenomenon actually is. So this sort of, I think the best way to sort of tackle this type of a question is in tiers. We're gonna talk about basically three different terms in this, um, in this Dean Salon. We'll talk about AI, we'll talk about machine learning, and we're gonna talk about deep learning or neural networks. And I'll sort of try to break each three of those, the three of those things down. So when people talk about AI, I like to think about a functional definition. It's almost like what isn't AI, right? Uh, I, like to, I like to think about AI or artificial intelligence as the use of software to perform a task that is commonly associated with human intelligence. Look, computers do a lot of things in the world. They do word processors, they do web apps, they do websites. There are just a whole bunch of different things that we use computers for, right? And I think what excites us is when software is making decisions that we associate with human intelligence, right? It's whether it's making some sort of a smart recommendation, picking a movie for you to, choose, to watch, or it is perceiving the world. It's telling you what is inside an image, or it is automatically translating a, a text from English to French, right? Those are tasks that I associate with human intelligence, and that's kind of my functional definition of AI. We're using software that almost mimics uh, an intelligent process that a human would have. Right. So that's kind of the overarching area of AI. What AI means as a computer science discipline is a little bit different than that colloquial definition. Right. What AI means as a computer science decision a discipline is usually the study of automated decision making. How do we sort of build systems that make decisions on their own? And how do we understand and understand the reliability and accuracy of those types of systems? So in this broad area of AI, which could literally be anything, any piece of software could be considered AI under this definition, right? In this broad field of AI, there's a very sort of new sort of topic or, or newish topic that is sort of driving most of the advances that we see called machine learning. To understand what machine learning means, we need to sort of tackle the question that David had before, right? What, what is reasoning or what is what is the form of intelligence that these systems have? Machine learning fundamentally studies identifying and extrapolating from patterns in data, okay? So historically, when we thought about data in a computing world, we usually have thought about data as a closed world of facts. For example, John has five sales. What are the whole number of sales? God direct the data and that answer, right? That five plus six is in total sales. That is a closed world reasoning problem. Now, if you were to ask the question, uh, how, many sales does, uh, how many sales does Fred have? Fred is not in that database, right? Uh, that question can't be answered by classical reasoning systems. 
And that's really where machine learning has sort of made its pay. It is able to sort of say that, well, it looks like most of the people inside your database have between five and six sales. It is likely that Fred sales lie somewhere in the middle, right? It is those types of open world reasoning questions that really require understanding the mathematical patterns inside data and being able to extrapolate from them, answer questions that we've not explicitly seen before. And that is the sort of the intelligence, that is the form of intelligence that we're talking about with a limited amount of examples and actually a in the grand scheme of things, a fairly limited amount of examples, we have very powerful tools to be able to model some of the very difficult types of decision problems we have in the world today, right? So that same way, you should just sort of think about this, like if we're gonna talk a lot about these language models, you should really think about this, John has five sales, Sally has six sales, how many sales does Fred have? And we haven't explicitly seen that before. Now, neural networks are one and sort of the key technology behind all of the recent advances in this language modeling that we sort of see coming out of AI. And really they're a class of very complex mathematical models. They can model very complex mathematical patterns in data. For example, what are the typical structures and sentences and how in sentences in English and how do those map to typical sentence structures in French, right? Those are the types of things that neural networks are able to mathematically capture. Now, the debate for this, this salon is whether that is a human form of intelligence or whether that is another form of intelligence or a form of mimicry. But I think it's enough that we sort of wrap our heads around all of these different definitions. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn to Allison now. And um, again, if you could define some terms for us, your field is computational linguistics. Well, I think some of us or most of us have a sense of what linguistics is as a general discipline. Of course, our university has one of the world's great departments of linguistics. So Allison, what is computational linguistics? How does it relate to general linguistics or other kinds of linguistics? And then maybe you could say something about um, how it relates to this whole AI question that we're raising tonight. Yeah, absolutely. So. Computational linguistics is a fairly general umbrella term that encompasses a couple of major sub areas. And so typically when I explain what computational linguistics is, I, I go for two different sub areas there. One of them involves applying computational methods to ask the same types of questions that linguists and cognitive scientists are always asking about how language operates in humans, in the human brain. So humans are exceptionally robust at processing and understanding language. This is something we haven't yet achieved in artificial intelligence. And the basic problem in linguistics and in the language subpart of, of cognitive science is understanding how that works um, and how the system of language works and how humans manage to do it so well. And so we can apply computational methods in a variety of ways to ask questions about that. This may involve doing corpus studies, but it may also involve applying computational models to test theories about how language works in humans. So we may apply a computational model to say, okay, we think maybe this is how the brain is working. We give it linguistic inputs, inputs of different sentences and things like that, see if it operates, behaves in a similar way to the way we know humans to behave with language. And this allows us to test hypotheses. So this is one side of this. This is the human side of using computational methods to ask questions about humans. The other side of computational linguistics is much more closely related to what Sanjay was just describing, which is trying to apply computational methods to achieve human level capacities, specifically in language. So artificial intelligence involves many different capacities, not limited to language, but computational linguistics also interfaces very closely and encompasses the field that we refer to as natural language processing, which is a subcomponent of artificial intelligence specifically focused on achieving strong language performance in AI. And so this is the other side of computational linguistics. This is the side that engages very closely with engineering and says, what is it that we need to do to be able to improve and achieve language competence in machines? And so these are, the, these are the two basic components. And I think that both of these are relevant to the topic that we're discussing today. Um, but I would say that in, you know, in following up on uh, this question of what is, what is artificial intelligence? What is computational linguistics trying to do? There's a very practical definition, which often is predominant in computer science, which is, well, artificial intelligence is just trying to solve the tasks that, we're, uh, that, that, that are associated with human intelligence, exactly as Sanjay said. Um, 
And then there's sort of underlyingly this other way of thinking about artificial intelligence, which we often tend to think about from this more scientific perspective because of the way that we think about intelligence in the brain, which is to what extent are these models underlyingly relative to this, the performance that we're seeing actually representing the types of information that, that, that we want them to represent. So to what extent, when we give an, a language input to an artificial intelligence model, to what extent is it internally managing to represent all the information that a human manages to extract from that linguistic input? And this does have very direct practical implications because if the, if the models are not managing to extract and represent that information, then there's a very good chance that they will not be as robust in their performance down, down the road. So we may see, and we see this over and over again, and I'm sure we'll talk about this more. Um, we see repeatedly that we have models, for instance, that are fit to a very particular task. They seem to do very well on that task. And people are, are led to believe that the models are have become very intelligent with respect to that task. But then when we subject them to inputs that are adversarial in some way or simply different from the types of inputs that they've been trained on and that they've originally learned from, because of the fact that underlyingly they aren't representing robustly the types of information that humans do, we see that they end up being very brittle to these types of perturbations. And so this is a, a, an approach to artificial intelligence that I think is a little bit more um, characteristic of, of linguists and cognitive scientists and folks who are more interested in the sort of representational capacities of the models um, and the extent to which that reflects and aligns with the representational capacities that humans have with respect to language and information. You raise a number of very interesting questions already, uh, both of you in your answers, because what comes to my mind immediately is the idea that maybe Sanjay or a computer scientist trying to engineer a system that achieves really good language performance doesn't care at all about whether what he's doing is an accurate model of the human brain or human language capacity at all. I mean, that's irrelevant, right? In which case, there's a distinction between the two parts of computational linguistics you talked about and maybe even a, a sort of opposition between them. Are you trying to build a computational model of how the brain works or how, how human nervous systems and bodies produce language um, uh, and, and somehow validate that or test that in the way that computational modeling is done in so many areas of science, right? Like in physics and chemistry, we get that. Or do you just want something that works and maybe produce an alien computer intelligence that thinks on completely different principles or doesn't think at all, but does achieve something using a completely different method. So could you talk a little bit more, Allison, about the tension between the two parts of your work? Absolutely, yeah. I wouldn't call it tension, but the, the, the distinction that you highlighted is absolutely valid. So from an engineering perspective, there is no specific constraint saying that we need to try to replicate the mechanisms that underlie linguistic competence in humans. Uh, on the cognitive side, when we're trying to understand how, how language works in humans, absolutely, this is the, the single thing that we're trying to do. We're trying to uh, understand what those mechanisms are. But from an engineering perspective, it, it is not necessary that we solve the language problem in the same way that the brain has. If we can produce systems that in every possible way are as robust and as generalizable in their linguistic competence as humans are, then it simply doesn't matter if the mechanisms are the same. We do, however, absolutely need to uh, replicate the human uh, capacity for language. So the outputs that humans manage and, and the behaviors that humans manage, this is absolutely and very clearly and directly the goal that we have in artificial intelligence. But if, if the, the mechanisms that the brain uses to do this are not the same as the mechanisms that we end up using to solve the problem in AI, this just doesn't matter from an engineering perspective. Now, the only uh, caveat to this is if the only solution <laughs> to, 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 to intelligence that will fully manage to reach human level intelligence is the mechanistic the mechanistic approach that the brain has, then we may end up needing to replicate a brain. But there's no reason at this point to assume that that's the case 
at this at this time that that would be the only reason that we would need absolutely on the engineering side to to replicate the mechanisms that the human brain uses and the question i guess is there's no reason to assume that the human brain actually does language in the best possible way either right i mean that's sort of the to to decenter the human being as maybe the best possible language machine we don't know <laughs> I, yeah, i'm joking listen. a little bit but uh, yeah I'll, I'll say just one more thing on, on that because that's an interesting and that raises a very interesting question when it comes to what language understanding is because language is a uniquely human thing it's it is potentially impossible to define what it would mean to have superhuman right. language understanding right. you can have superhuman uh you can have superhuman language adjacent competences like being able to speak more languages than a given human or have access to more information than a given human. But if you hold constant that a given human knows the relevant language and knows the relevant information, then what it means to understand a given sentence, I don't think there's any way to define that no. other than- Well, the then the, the category doesn't apply that. outside of the human sphere in, in that sense. Exactly, exactly. So, so, so trying to define, you know, solving the problem in a superhuman way is actually a little bit um, odd it, from a language understanding perspective. There are many intelligence uh, domains for which it's very well defined, for which we can definitely solve things in a superhuman way, but language understanding may not be one of those domains. Okay. So I want to get to our philosopher in just a minute because he's been waiting very patiently, but I have one last question uh, for Allison and Sanjay, and this has to do with what is meant by a language model or large language model, such as in, in these popular uh, articles that talk about what is it the GPT-3 system runs on a, in a vast computer center in the cornfields of Iowa on 285,000 CPUs running massively in parallel. And okay, that's large, I guess. It's a big number. But first, Allison, you know, when they say language model in that context of machine learning and neural networks, it's obviously not an explicit representation of a grammar or vocabulary. So what do they mean by language model? Yeah, great. So Language model can be a very confusing term because it sounds like it could refer to just any model that's operating on language. And within the context of NLP, it means something more specific, which is a, a model that is trained in a very specific way with a particular objective, which is predicting words in context. Right. So if I said to you, uh, I take my coffee with cream and blank, you could make a prediction there. There's a lot of information that you bring to bear in making that prediction. And this language modeling uh, sort of type of objective, which is based in an even earlier um, sort of popular source of, of training and, and, and learning signal, which is just basic distributional statistics of words and other linguistic units. This is what drives these language models. These are, these are very, very large neural networks, which Sanjay ha has described a few minutes ago, which are just very simply trained so that they can optimally predict words in context. It's a very simple task and it's very popular because of the fact that you can use massive amounts of data without requiring any type of annotation. It's a very cheap, very, very, very cheap type of learning signal. And it's it, you get a lot of bang for your buck because there's a lot of information that the models end up learning and a lot of abstraction that they end up learning about language as a result of trying to optimize on that objective. So we're not building in any direct structure about language but with respect to whether they're representing things about language, it seems like they probably are. They seem to be learning quite a bit about the structure of language as a result of needing to learn to predict. Uh, and of course the question is, is that what human children are doing? Is that what human brains are doing or not? This is, this is a bigger is, question. Is learning, I'm happy learning to answer to that one. <laughs> the next word, like learning to yeah. predict what should be the next word in the utterance. But Sanjay, can you tell us a little bit from your perspective about what is a large language model? Yeah, yeah. So I think Allison did a really good job of explaining what a language model is. And I think what does large mean? So if we think about like all of these different, again, what we taught, the, the, the way that I introduced a model was that it's this tool that we can learn the mathematical structure of the data that we have in front of us, right? And every piece of that mathematical structure is represented in what is called a parameter in these language models. Now, it is not uncommon for these language models to have hundreds of billions, if not tri nearing trillions of parameters now. These models are becoming massive. And the amount and the reason for it is it's sort of an intuitive thing, right? As we sort of incorporate more and more data in them, we are actually making the models commensurately larger and larger to sort of account for all the different mathematical patterns we see in that data. So a company like Google basically has the entire internet at their disposal, and they can 
find, train these simple models that predict the next word or predict a word in context over the entire internet. And this can get a very rich understanding of what random samples of human language look like, right? And that's really what we're using all this compute power to do. We basically take the entire internet and use it to synthesize a distributional understanding of what human language looks like. And that powers modern natural language understanding. Of course, we we'll come back to the critique of that from the ethical perspective. I don't know if you know this article on the stochastic parrot, right? I mean, that, and maybe I'll ask you about that a little bit later, but I was fascinated to read about that recently, this idea that, okay, you're training the language model on what's out there on the internet. What if there's a lot of crap out there on the internet? What if there's a lot of error and bad stuff or, 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 or incomplete stuff? You know, is it garbage in, garbage out or not, right, in that case? And is that, or are humans just doing the same thing themselves? I think some of us would say that it looks like human beings are pretty good stochastic parrots sometimes. But I want to turn to uh, uh, Malte uh, to bring the philosophical perspective here. And um, just going back to all this popular press articles that we're seeing about AI and about um, the great, rather remarkable achievements of things like GPT-3, a constant theme that we hear from computer scientists and linguists and critics in general is that we're not getting any closer to having computers display common sense, right? There's this common sense problem uh, where uh, you still get rather um, bizarre errors or, or really stupid things coming out sometimes of even the most sophisticated systems where the software makes a, a basic error that a human being would not make. And so the question for you, Malte, is, you know, insofar as common sense seems to be a basic feature of human intelligence, um, is it particularly relevant to language comprehension? I mean, is common sense something that is um, inherent in, um, in uh, human language comprehension as opposed to other kinds of intelligence when language comprehension seems to be uh, at first sight more about grammar and vocabulary. What do you, what would you say? Yeah. To that? <clears throat> Great, thanks, yeah. So, um, I mean, this I, I think connects very clearly with, you know, some of the things that have been mentioned before. Um, I mean, one thing that I think what makes you know, philosophy very relevant for these kind of discussions is that philosophers of language have thought for a long time about, you know, what is understanding, what is linguistic understanding, what is semantic competence, and um, well, what do you need to know in order to to know a language? And one thing when it comes to common sense or you know common knowledge is, I mean, there's kind of first of all there's some good news as it were. Um, because it actually turns out that you don't need to know that much. At, at least, you know, there are very good arguments for thinking that you don't need to know that much to actually understand a language. I mean, in order to understand what the word astritis or gold, I mean, you don't have to really know, you know, what kind of these um, conditions are or, you know, what the atomic number of uh, gold is. Or so it seems, I mean, partly because uh, you know, you can learn about these things by actually understanding what the teacher tells you about it, right? Um, so, so philosophers have, you know, like uncovered some, I think, you know, quite plausible, but also surprising implications about, you know, like semantic competence and, uh, you know, the kind of, that is actually in, in a certain sense sin that you don't have to know that much. And I think that is relevant for these kind of data extraction that you see on these, you know, that, um, you know, GPT-3 is doing um, insofar as a lot of information that is, you know, like uncovered there is kind of not relevant for semantic competence, right? I mean, it's, this is not so much as a criticism as just saying like, look, you know, there's a lot of data that gets lots of information that is extracted that is not per se required for, um, you know, semantic uh, competence. Um, and um, so, so how does common sense then, however, you know, come in? And I think, you know, again, there, I think, you know, that there have been some results, some observations that philosophers have made in the past and that actually have been picked up for by, you know, computer scientists, especially, you know, already like in the uh, first wave AI, you know, the kind of first step at artificial intelligence. And um, 
just you know to give a little bit of context also to the discussion that we've seen in this New York Times article about you know common sets, common knowledge, and its relevance. Um, I mean, one kind of um, I would say maybe like a folk belief, at least that philosophers are having, and then there's the question whether it's correct, which is, I think, you know, where we need to see whether, you know, like how these, um, you know, AI systems actually work is the suggestion that common sense is needed to um, actually like um, disambiguate and to um, do especially like, you know, knowing, knowing like what demonstratives refer to. So just, you know, there's this kind of famous example from, um, uh, Vinograd, you know, which is saying something like, um, you know, the city, which is just this example, you know, the city council refused the demonstrators the permit. And now compare, um, you know, um, the city council ref uh, refused the demonstrators the permit. They feared violence, right? Um, what does they refer to in this case? Well, it's, it's you know, like people go for city council, right? Contrasted with the city council refused to demonstrate as a permit, so the same sentence, but uh, they advocated violence. What does they refer to in this context? Well, it seems to be the demonstrators, right? Now, um, it, so I mean, it, it, it seems that, you know, in order to understand what was said, well, you need to resolve the, you know, demonstration that, or they in this case, um, in the right way. And in order to do that, it seems that you need to know something about, um, well, that requires world knowledge, maybe something about fear, demonstration, on what grounds do people refuse someone else permits, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why, you know, like there's this idea that in order to be, you know, competent at this level, you just need to have a lot of common sense, a lot of world knowledge. And that is, of course, why, you know, there was this kind of big push that ultimately then failed or seemed to be dissatisfying in the first wave AI, um, you know, movement to basically say, like, look, we need these kind of common knowledge databases, which lead to this kind of insane um, projects, you know, like trying to build all these kind of systems. Um, and I think it, it just, you know, like to make this final remark here, I think, you know, just to clarify again, something from the New York Times article insofar as, you know, mentioned it, I just wanted to point out really quickly here that, um, you know, the case that has been discussed here um, is, um, you know, like this is a scenario where, uh, you know, like the, you ask the artificial intelligence, well, where is the person going to look for the keys or something like that, right? So someone places a, you know, key in the drawers and then someone moves the keys somewhere else behind the pillow or something like that, and they come back into the room and then you ask the AI, okay, so where is the person actually going to look for the keys? And then you say, well, you know, they left when it was in the drawer, so they're going to look at the drawer. Um, I mean, that is very impressive that the AI can do that, but I don't quite think that this actually shows that it has like common sense world knowledge. I mean, these seem to be more like tasks um, for, you know, like whether or not the thing has a theory of mind. So, you know, these are these kind of tests, whether they uh, which you'd sometimes run with children and then there's, you know, and, and there's these kind of familiar results, though, so actually, like, again, these are old results, they have been, you know, there have been some new studies that, you know, people on the autism spectrum and so on are, you know, not as good as, you know, these kind of um, doing these kind of tasks. And um, I mean, these kind of theories of minds being able to basically put yourself into someone else's shoes. Um, that is relevant, very relevant for, you know, like kind of the linguistic competence of pragmatics, you know, kind of getting irony, being able to derive implicatures, et cetera, et cetera. If you don't have that, if you fail these kind of tasks, then you are, this is an empirical fact, normally pretty bad at, you know, calculating implicatures and getting irony and things like that. Um, but it's, and, you know, again, this is very impressive, but it doesn't quite show yet, I mean, that we have something like common sense or world knowledge or something like that. Um, so I think there the jury is still out, actually, whether, uh, you know, like we are really uh, there yet. And um, again, I think, you know, like a very interesting hypothesis that is, you know, then can be matched against, you know, like how these systems actually perform is to what extent, you know, well, do we have already common sense there and to what extent is common sense actually really required to do these kind of quite complicated tasks that are easy for humans, but you know, difficult for, for machines, uh, for example, disambiguation, um, anapho resolution to demonstrate, you know, like knowing what they refers to in context. 
So that is, I think, you know, like where um, philosophy and philosophy of language uh, meets um, AI in a very intimate way. I want to follow up with a couple of questions for you, Malte, and then throw it over to Sanjay and Allison to, to weigh in, because this, I think we can all agree this common sense question, how do we define what that means and, you know, how does it affect your perspective, I think is important for uh, not just philosophers, of course, but linguists and and computer scientists who are trying to, shall we say, emulate common sense in some way. And so to follow up with you first, Malte, um, just reminding myself, and you and I have discussed this before, that the one of the, the powerful critiques of first wave AI, you know, the, the AI where everything's explicitly symbolically represented, like world knowledge, it's just, you just end up have to have a huge database of facts, right? In like the psych system and other things that one of the early critiques of that from the perspective of phenomenology is that it's not a problem of how many facts, because as you said, you sometimes don't need very many facts to have common sense. It's knowing which facts are relevant, however few or many of the facts are, is what is the criterion of relevance in the situation at hand? And the older philosophical critique from that perspective linked it back to the body, right? That like, just like demonstratives saying, you know, first person, second person, third person, this, that, I, you, or, or deixis in linguistic terms, this is fundamentally rooted in the fact that the linguistic being, you know, has a body, right? There's, there's, some, there's some sort of locus which uh, conveys some, uh, you know, primary understanding of these terms. I mean, I'm, I'm mangling this discussion, so maybe you can clarify a little bit for the audience, Malti, what we're talking about. But, you know, in, from the point of view of philosophy of language, I think um, what you said about uh, demonstratives and the, the great difficulty in actually having uh, an artificial system know what is meant by, you know, you know some pronoun in, the, in context, and the great difficulty of, of having a world knowledge that is somehow disembodied uh, seems to be something that keeps cropping up. So could, maybe you could uh, comment on, on that perspective. Yeah, um, uh, I mean, I think that uh, it's, it's, it's relevant. Um, I mean, you know, this, this is uh, maybe a little bit about, you know, the title of this, of this session. I mean, like it's, right. it's um, 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 it's it's about you know language intelligence the mind or the soul and um, well the body it doesn't figure in the title and and I, I think that's uh, well you know I mean I think it's an uh, you can think about it what they want but I think that there are going to be some philosophers who are going to think this is not a innocent uh, omission um, I mean it, it could one could say that this session, in virtue of its title, is kind of in the grip of, um, you know, like a Cartesian, um, you know, Descartes or Platonic view about intelligence, right? And that was, you know, one of the first um, you know, criticisms of AI, just, you know, like a little bit of background, I mean, just, just elaborating a little bit on what you were saying about, I mean, the... Uh, the 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 uh, most famous criticism was, of course, you know, by um, people such as you know Hubert Dreyfus and or you know, Yuji Chicago, Joan Hoagland, which was very inspired by um, Heidegger, and uh, you know, like one of the I mean, I'm not going to bore you too much with it, but but you know, one of the key suggestions was here, which I think is very important and very plausible. Is that our, you know, primary way of actually discovering the world, as it were, you know, of, of interacting intelligently with the world is not so much theoretical, mathematical, or you know, representational, just but actually like by by this kind of activity that Heidegger called skillful coping, but I mean, which is basically just you know, getting stuff done, you know, just interacting with the world in an intelligent way at a practical level. And you know the, the, the first criticism of a of, of first wave AI, the most prominent one, was then that you know this kind of intelligence is non-representational. It is not articulated. It's not a theory. Um, the kind of knowledge of how to interact with a hammer does not you know consist in a database. It is just you know being able to handle it in the right way. 
Um, and I, I think, you know, that's really important to just realize and actually like, you know, some of the critics of, you know, first wave AI pointed it out is that, you know, the second wave AI, what, what we're having here now is, 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 you know, kind of avoiding this charge because it is not, you know, like theory, it's not like explicit representation, it is all, you know, like encoded in this neurons, etc. Uh, so they avoid this charge, but what is important, I think, is what is still missing and that, you know, there, I think, you know, this is just, you know, like a suggestion that this is really relevant, is, is that, you know, we don't have embodied intelligence, I mean, uh, we, we don't have a something interacting with the world in a practical way, right? And one, one could think that this is, you know, like very crucial actually, like for this kind of intelligence, this kind of skillful coping that, 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 that um, Heidegger and then later Dreyfus and Hoffman were concerned with. And just one more thing, I, I think one thing that is also still up in the air a little bit, which was very important, is that in order to discover a world, to actually learn about the world, you have to care. You need to have something like plans, desires. Um, without that, nothing can. You, nothing you 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 know. Nothing is going to really show itself to you, because it doesn't matter. And that is, you know, building, of course, to this relevance dimension that that you know is 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 that you just briefly alluded to. And that is, of course, you know, this this very uh, famous quote from from Hoekland in criticizing, you know, first wave AI is that the problem with computers is they don't they don't give a damn. And, you know, then, of course, you know, there's a question once again, to what extent, you know, uh, you might think that this is also still missing from, um, you know, like what we what we see in, in this kind of uh, wave. So, uh, I mean, just to close it off, I think it's, um, it's, it, it's, it's not necessarily like a, uh, you know, like, it depends on what you want to do with artificial intelligence, as, as Sanjay has pointed out. Um, so depending on what you want to do with these kind of systems, that kind of issues may or may not matter. But I think insofar as, you know, we, we are wondering about, you know, what the ambitions of these systems could be um, and, you know, what it would mean to actually like model something like maybe intelligence, human intelligence, but also maybe like linguistic ability, the ability to speak a language. These kind of things may very well matter. Well, let, let me turn up now to Allison, because I know, like, from your perspective, you've maybe thought about this in different terms. And I know that in psychology and neuroscience, you know, there's a lot of discussion about how human beings, um, you know, not just as sort of disembodied brains, but, you know, in a certain uh, bodily context and in a certain environment, how, you know, how we respond to that and how that might uh, flow through into language. Do you have any uh, comments on this whole question of um, the body or not separating the mind from the body, which is what I take uh, Malte to be saying is to avoiding that dualism of a mind and a body. Go ahead, Alison. Yeah, certainly. So this is something that has, that connects very closely to, to a topic that has come up a lot in natural language processing. Uh, recently, with, especially with respect to these types of models, which is the idea that these models have access only to text, they don't have any access to the world, they certainly don't have bodies. And so to the extent that we tr are trying to define what it means to say understand language, um, when a human understands language, if I say, for instance, cat to you, you understand the word cat. And there's a lot that you understand about the word cat that involves perceptual information, like what a cat looks like and what a cat feels like and sounds yes. like. If I talk about happiness or, you know, uh, uh, itching, something like that, you know, these are, you know, physical or emotional sensations that you are able to identify with, which is not something that is going to be part of whatever understanding could possibly even be for for a system that doesn't have access to any type of perceptual information or emotions or anything like that. So we can certainly define aspects of what it means to understand language and try to divorce that from grounding in the world and from you know all of the perceptual and physical sensations and things like that 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 humans have. But there's no getting around the fact that what it means to understand language in as a human in large part does involve those things. So there's a, there's a big part of, of understanding that is going to be that and that is just a non-starter for, for models that don't have access to those things. Um, but there is a lot of 
information about like how similar words are to each other, uh, which sentences entail which other sentences and things like that, which are relationally defined and don't require grounding in the world, which the models can potentially achieve. And so we do sort of need to draw that line quite clearly with respect to what is in principle possible for a model that doesn't have a body and doesn't have access to the world. Um, and when it comes back to this question of common sense, defining common sense, common sense is not trivial. Um, and there are certain aspects of common sense that we can probably define, like we could just also express them in terms of language. Like um, when people are afraid of violence, they tend to try to prevent the people who are advocating violence from getting permits, right? The, 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 this type of thing. You can, you can try to define common sense knowledge in terms of more language, but then of course you need to understand the language in order to make use of that common sense knowledge. And so there's a bit of circularity in Infinite that. Infinite regress really, yeah. Like. Yeah, so, so absolutely. So, so uh, what language, I think there's no getting around the fact that what language understanding is to a human involves a lot of actual interaction with the world and, and feeling and perception and things like that. There are ways that you can try to under, define a version of understanding that doesn't involve that, um, but it, it can be quite difficult to draw that line because you, you do pretty quickly get into aspects of understanding that do interface with the world pretty quickly when you're trying to define those things. I have a question for Sanjay, and I don't know if he's going to like the question. Yeah, yeah. But what comes to my mind is robots and self-driving cars, or to say, let's not have 285,000 CPUs, like the body of GPT-3 is just some stationary thing in a cornfield in Iowa, but let's have a robot or a self-driving car with all, all kinds of sensory input data, you know, LIDAR and radar and image data and, you know, air pressure and friction, all, all kinds of data beyond just the linguistic and also put in it a language model so that you can talk to your car or your robot and say, do this and that. So from your perspective, would some of what we're talking about perhaps have an engineering solution if it's just a matter of combining in a massive model other kinds of data other than the purely linguistic? Or am I thinking about this all wrong from your good. perspective? I, good, I, I think that uh, there's kind of, I think there's an interesting thing that Malta dropped when he was talking about human intelligence is that there's maybe a pragmatic way to look at human intelligence. And I think that the pragmatic is really going to be the key word when we think about machine learning and the kind of intelligence that we have in these computing systems. I'll give you guys a simple example. So this, this type of ambiguity uh, that we talked about in the li in linguistic models uh, also is just going to happen in any form of computational intelligence. Let's imagine that we're designing a self-driving car system to uh, identify a cow, okay? And all our images of cows have cows on farms, okay? Now, if you were to come up with a model that tried to infer the latent patterns in these images that determine cow versus not cow, does the presence of grass in an image probably very strongly relates to there being a cow. And if those are the only examples of grass that you've seen or green grass or any only examples of a farm you're seeing. Have you built a farm classifier or have you built a cow classifier? This is something that no machine learning model today would be able to disambiguate because fundamentally the information needed to disambiguate is outside of the data set that was used to train it, right? Now, you could go about, someone could argue that, well, if we said that a cow is an animal and we had a rough explanation of, to this to the algorithm, what it was looking for, what types of features it needed to look for in those images, what types of mathematical patterns that looked at a certain size and so on. But now there becomes a pragmatic engineering side of that, right? Could you go through every single object or every single class and as an engineer start defining what those are, right? We would like to have, not only our models generalized, but we like our methodologies to generalize across multiple things, right? So that's kind of really the root of the problem, right? You can call this problem by many names. You can call it common sense reasoning. Uh, a signal processing person would say this is a lack of causal reasoning, right? That the under these, these systems are underlying, the underlying systems are finding correlations and correlations don't necessarily imply causations, right? We don't know why this image is a cow uh, is because we don't, un, we, we know that cows are correlated with farms, but we don't know the direction of correlation there, right? So like there are many different explanations for it, but I sort of think that adding more sources doesn't 
fundamentally solve that issue, right? It does give us more information. We can make a richer set of, but the underlying practice decisions that engineers will have to make are still there, right? That an art of engineering is simplicity, is understanding how, what you have to model to properly accomplish your task, right? And a self-driving car is not going to be any different, right? That means that if the self-driving car does not have to model the difference between a pedestrian and a, any other ob, any other moving obstacle on the road, like, like let's say there's a pedestrian or a Roomba and you didn't have to model the difference between those things, you're not going to have it. You're not going to build that into your system, right? There's a cost reason for it, right? So I think that that's kind of, I think that that's almost the interesting part about what we're talking about here, right? That, that yeah. Well, I want to press you on that because what I hear you saying is it's just impractical because of the quantity of processing speed and amount of data, or is it? Because say you had quantum computer, like say you had your self-driving Tesla or Ford F-150, let's let's give a boost to another car company. Yeah. So say you had your self-driving Ford F-150 electric car, uh, you know, now I've lost my train of thought here. Um, maybe you can help me out. Where was I going with that? Um, I, I, I guess the point that I was trying to make is that from an engineering perspective, it makes sense to model the phenomena needed right. to do your task. And right. but, but say, and, say cost is on a say processing speed and story and amount of data is not the issue. You know, say that's been solved and you just have orders of magnitude more of both, is there a problem in principle with training your Ford F-150 not to run over a cow that's standing on the asphalt because it doesn't recognize it? You know, yeah, you, I mean, I, 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 think, I, I, think, I actually think that the, the interesting answer is that in principle, the answer seems to be no. People are absolutely trying this, right? That NVIDIA had a great example a few years ago when I was in graduate school of just taking video from cameras and basically figuring out, mimicking what a human would do from a steering wheel and it kind of worked, right? And I think that the scary part is that it kind of works, right? Kind of works. I think, I, I think that, what that, uh, but what that doesn't tell us is what is the long tail of behaviors that you might see? Right. Is your system going to generalize? Is it robust to those kinds of cases? Right. I think that the other thing that, it's, that it, it doesn't tell us is that we are solving a simplified intelligence task, right? We're sort of drawing lines in the world, like literally on the street to sort of simplify the amount of cognitive processing that needs to actually happen, right? And in that process are the underlying mechanisms of these models identify different than human reasoning just because their task is different, right? Yeah. The, the scope of what it needs to be able to achieve is different. Well, I also think that practically, that's, that, that's, that's the in principle side of it. I also do think that practically speaking in many, in many computer vision areas, right? We are seeing a limit of what this past this, the second wave of AI strategy of just getting massive data sets and massive models and combining them together. We're sort of seeing a ceiling on what we can achieve. So I think that there is the, in principle, it seems like actually the answer is, is weirdly almost. And, uh, and I think, but in practice, the answer is no. <laughs> well, I mean, it's just exciting to think about, you know, as, as uh, um, Malte raised this, old, old criticism stemming from the work of Heidegger and then, you know, at our university represented by uh, John Hoagland, who many of us knew before he passed away, great philosopher, you know, this idea that maybe this kind of second wave AI with the strengthening of, you know, if the neural network model is, you know, it was, it was modeled after the human brain in the first place, if that can be perfected and if there are enough layers and that there's enough data and enough speed, can we come close to, you know, Dasein making its way in der Welt, you know, like to, to you know, <laughs> I, I throw that one out for, for Malta, you know, like that, that is that, you know, is it, that might actually be a, a possible model. That's what's exciting to think about having abandoned sort of the explicit conceptual representation of the world and talking about you know, this correlational uh, approach 
upon which then reasoning um, would be uh, built uh, as a secondary thing. But I'm getting off topic here. Can I, getting can into I just, make, just make, But Malte, why don't you react to this? No, no I can just one little remark as it were to sharpen the point. Uh, I mean, it is very tempting to think that our, um, you know, like, ability to speak and our ability to do X, Y, Z, you know, our intelligence is, 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 is a function as it were of our, how our brain developed. You know, I mean, like, you know, what, what kind of neural connections we had, et cetera. I think what the, um, what the kind of alternative would be, or, you know, like one way of exploring. And I think my, my understanding is that at least, you know, this, has been taken seriously by by some AI researchers is that it may also be a function of our kind of of our bodies and of our ability to manipulate objects. Let's say it might really be something like a function of our hands, right? Um, so and you know if that's so, then it is not necessarily you know like that you know a question about the quantity of data or you know putting different data sources together. It's really a question of you know what kind of you know, like what kind of learning is actually available to you um, or to the to the machine or to the artificial system. And uh, if it, if it's like that, then, you know, it, it there, we will expect a ceiling when we just, you know, push, you know, this kind of neural network story further because, uh, you, you know, like the develop, it, it, it's not only a question about, you know, the, well, the neural network, but it's also a question about other, functionalities and there I think you know it's very striking that when it comes to questions I mean there are these kind of funny charts you know whose job will be replaced um at what time right you know and then you know you'll see oh philosophy professors oh we're up you know we, we're up soon you know uh, um I, I think archaeologists are a little you know better off there you know and and linguists anyway and computer scientists so 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 you see that right but I mean, it's interesting that, you know, for example, when it comes to things like, you know, like nurses or, or you know, um, you know, given the kind of tasks that they're going to perform, you know, that they are performing, uh, that that's actually going to be way off. <laughs> um, so, again, as, you know, because of the complexity of the task of the, of the physical task. And again, I mean, that suggests that. I mean, th that is, I think, is interesting because it could very well be that, you know, the next step towards um, you know, like reaching a new level of intelligence is actually, you know, limited by the kind of implementing this kind of, you know, physical systems or this kind of mechanical system. So, so that is, I think, is just, you know, like maybe also just a, a positive suggestion that is coming out of that. And that I think is, is important, especially, you know, like making the pitch for philosophy here. It's, it's not just about standing in the corner and, you know, criticizing, but, you know, just, you yeah. know, um, insofar as, uh, you know, like we are doing, you know, mind design here, which is, you know, again, like a Hopeland phrase, I mean, like reverse engineering human intelligence, I think, uh, the humanities have a lot to offer here, but just, you know, reflect, but by, by virtue of having reflected on what intelligence is, and thus, you know, um, not only, you know, like maybe sometimes calling out the grandeur, but also by, you know, making positive suggestions as to what avenues to explore. Right, that's, um, and Can I quickly go respond? Ahead, Sandra, yeah, and Allison good, too. Good, good, good. Yeah. Good. So I, I want to add in a different life. I worked on robotics problems, and I think that Malta's point is actually extremely good. I think that in many robotics problems, we don't appreciate just hardware challenges. To have the same sensor density and rarity as a human is, is, is nearly impossible, right? And I think it's like, just think about the number of tactile sensors we have in our hand, right? And the complexity of the human hand, right? That we struggle to make a robot with two fingers, like one degree of freedom close, right? And like, now we talk about the, 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 both the manipulation richness of the human hand, as well as the, the integrated sensing, right? That is also embodied inside your body and, and connected to your mind, right? So I think that that's one side of it that is sort of underappreciated. And it's an absolutely great point to make that in any of these embodied problems, actually hardware is a significant limitation. I do think that another interesting piece is going to be the role that simulation plays. And, and I bet if we were to have this panel five years from now, and especially as more and we see more and more robots and more and more autonomous vehicles at whatever capacity in the real world, I bet we'll be talking about the role of simulation, right? And I think that this is increasingly how the AI systems are 
learning to interact with their world and learning to sort of make decisions is using simulations. And I think that, again, there are a different set of challenges. Maybe there aren't the challenges of the second wave of AI, but now you're fundamentally limited by what the engineer has chosen to simulate properly, right? And and you, you kind of have, you've moved the buck now from the learning side to the simulation side. And I think that that poses a, that as these things become more popular and as that becomes uh, an important modality for creating the data for these systems, I think that'll become an interesting philosophical question almost, right? That like, where is the line drawn, right? Of like, of what are we learning? Right. Well, I have much to say, but I want to ask Allison if you had more thoughts in this general area. I have one more question I'd like to throw out to the panel. But Allison, did you have any more thoughts about this question? If if not, let, let me, um, in the last few minutes, since uh, time has flown and we have to move to the general Q&A in just a few minutes, you know, there's the there's the ethical dimension. We've we touched on it already. And um, Malta, you mentioned, you know, entire professions or occupations being replaced by AI or, you know, or even robots and so on. I mean, that's a phenomenon that's been going on in many ways. So there's obviously the question of the impact of AI on society in those, you know, obvious ways in terms of uh, the economic and, um, and professional lives of people. But I want to get back and maybe ask Allison about this problem of of the training set, <laughs> and you know, even the question of of critique and creativity. In, in other words, do you agree with those linguists? And I think it was a linguist or some others who were very critical of GPT three or something like that as being kind of this garbage in, garbage out. That it's that it's very overblown. It's just this, you know, massive correlations, and you know, if it's being trained on on all kinds of nonsense, then uh, we have to be very careful how we use it. It could be very dangerous. Do you have thoughts about that? Yeah, certainly. So there are sort of a couple of different issues when it comes to the nature of the data and the nature of the training objective. When it comes to social biases, um, this is one of the major concerns that has been raised repeatedly with respect to these types of models and with respect to any types of models that are trained on natural data. Um, or potentially even intentionally a dangerous data as has happened with, you know, in certain cases when people are trying to be difficult and um, with these types of models, there are statistical social biases encoded in the data that the models are being trained on, right? So you see um, uh, exacerbation of these types of things in, in, in the statistics that the models then encode. So for instance, you have uh, uh, encoded associations stronger associations between doctors and men and nurses and women or computer programmers and men and uh, uh, homemakers and women right and and this is this is as a result of the fact that these are the general statistical trends that you see in the data but this is of course not a type of assumption that you want the models to be making right these are these are these are very harmful types of of assumptions for for the models to encode and they can result in at, at, at very least uh, offending people and at worst, you know, uh, discrimination against people when making potentially high stakes decisions that, that will affect people's lives. So um, this is the basic type of concern that, that people have expressed with respect to social biases. And it relates closely to the, the basic way that the models are trained. These are models that are going to be learning on the basis of the statistics of the data. Uh, and so we're going to have models that are very good at telling you what's probable, but what we need is models to be able to systematically understand what, what is going on in the world and what, what they need to be able to do. So for instance, if you say to a model, I take my coffee with cream and it, it, it is very likely going to be able to tell you that, that sugar is going to be a probable continuation there. But if I said to you, I take my coffee with cream and salsa say this is a very strange continuation this is not something that's going to be probable probable in the data but you can understand it without any difficulty so this is a, a distinction that i that i highlight a lot which is the fact that humans also make predictions in context humans are also sensitive to statistical trends in, in data 
Um, but humans are also able to distinguish and handle handle low probability events as well right. because they have a more fundamental systematic model of of the process and of the system. And so, um, going back to the this issue of biases, it's also the case that humans are susceptible to these types of stereotypes and right. di and discrimination, and be, because of the fact that humans are also exposed to these types of trends in in the in their environment. Um, but humans are also able to recognize that there's nothing fundamental about group A that means that they can only be nurses, right, or, or, or only be computer programmers and things like this. And so these are the types of distinctions that we need both humans and models to be able to make, but that are not necessarily going to be emerging on the, on the basis of the training that, that we're using at the moment. Well, that's a great point upon which to end our cozy little uh chat among the four of us and we're going to open it up to other questions because what i hear you saying is that what we want is not just you know uh, an ai that can uh, mimic and repeat and propagate all the biases out there but that has some sort of critical capacity based on other knowledge which i would say is a definition of what the university of chicago is trying to help its students acquire right you know this ability to you know, understand what is, you know, the normal or statistically probable thing, but then to be handle the outliers and the long tail, as Sanjay said, and, you know, you know, and in a sense, you could think of all sorts of creative acts and critical acts on the part of our students, and we hope all of us, uh, that are really all about handling those outliers and, and raising them to, uh, to a prominent position. So maybe that's way too much to ask of uh, AI, even with um, 285,000 CPU cores. Uh, we'll wait uh, for a few the future results from Sanjay and his friends um, to see if we get there. And now I'd like to um, uh, open it up uh, to the Q&A session and I will address to the panel uh, some of the questions that have uh, come up. And the first question that we want to uh, throw out to you uh, is this, and I'll read it. Um, what are your thoughts about the implications for AI of sign language as it is used by native speakers of, of sign language, I gather, uh, especially regarding the question of how the bodily experience um, affects language and learning when in fact you're you're signing with gestures is there ai work going on that addresses this modality of language allison i'll start with you sure yeah this is, this is a great question um the answer is yes there is work it's not the predominant modality that folks are working with with respect to language uh, in part because there is more text available, in part because text is easier to work with, but absolutely there are folks working, including at the University of Chicago, on processing sign language inputs. And this of course requires the, 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 the visual modality to be processed. And so this introduces a whole other set of problems in terms of recognizing in images and or video uh, what signs are being produced at a given moment and then mapping this to uh, either to some sort of transcription of, uh, of some kind or, 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 or directly to, to meaning representations of some kind or, or to, to, to other types of task related outputs. So yeah, the, the answer is yes, folks are working on this. It's an area that could certainly st stand to expand further, but folks here at the University of Chicago ha have been actively working on that. Great. Um, another question, and um, I'll ask Sanjay this question. Uh, as we all know, Google and many uh, uh, email, Gmail and other email programs use a language model to predict our sentences as we're typing our emails. And we may choose the uh, suggested phrase or, or, or wording. Um, do we run the danger, run the risk of having um, more personal, quirky, uh, individual styles fading and getting a kind of standardization and homogenization of language. And I guess to add to that question, Sanjay, is that something that could be factored in? <laughs> yeah, 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 to, yeah, to yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I, I think like Allison's answer, I think that this is a very important area of research, right? 
And in some sense that, that these AI tools have come of age recently and understanding how humans interact with them and how they are going to be deployed is a very important question that a lot of people at U Chicago and elsewhere are studying, right? These are very complex feed, human algorithm feedback loops, right? We've talked a lot about AI, but there's also a complementary question of how humans respond to AIs, right? How humans respond to artificial intelligence. And I think that this is a great, a great example, right? You could totally imagine that if you took everything that we told you abs in this salon, literally, and you often hit Google suggestions, that is a reinforcement signal to the AI to continue to have those types of suggestions for everyone, right? So that is absolutely an outcome that could happen. But I think that this is, this is the frontier of our field, right? We need, like, before we never had a question of how would humans interact with them because they were sitting in a lab, these, these tools were sitting in a lab or sitting in some computer science research uh, paper, right? I think as we sort of deploy them in the real world, the real interesting questions happen about how do humans and algorithms ultimately collaborate to solve some very hard problems. Great. Uh, I have another question along similar lines. Uh, this says, uh, we've had a lot of, um, comment or discussion about ethics of AI. Um, what do the panelists think about a you know, policy uh, reaction to that, a bill of rights for an automated society? You know, like how does, in your view, I realize none of us here are public policy uh, experts or, or lawyers, but what would you think uh, personally, I'll start with you, Malta, about, um, you know, an appropriate response from those who understand the technology and can see some of the pitfalls in terms of um, uh, recommendations for how to handle it from a public policy perspective. Um, yeah, I mean, like, I, I think that, <clears throat> I mean, like, I mean, I think one, one, one question to just point out is, um, is there something like a specific ethics of AI question? I think it's, right. it's, it's actually one question that, sure. um, you know, some philosophers have asked. I mean, like, you know, there, there's a suggestion, I'm just putting it out a little bit provocatively, that, you know, the ethics of AI is the ethics of pencils. I mean, don't do harm with pencils and, you know, I mean, don't do harm with AI. I mean, so I mean, a little bit more complicated when the technology comes, but I mean, there's a question whether there are any kind of specific, um, you know, policies that go beyond, you know, just whatever we need when we have in like a new technology that we find kind of ways of regulating um, a little bit. I think that, uh, it, it, so, so I mean, yeah, I mean, obviously, um, I mean, I think there's a question of, um, you know, like with policies, uh, my, my question is always how do we enforce them, actually, which I think is, 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 is a non-trivial one when it comes to artificial intelligence or, you know, these modern techniques. But I just want to throw in just one little thought here. Again, I think, you know, one question we need to, I mean, like, I think one interesting question, once again, is, is actually like, uh, how do... Uh, I mean, kids pick up biases, they pick up bad stuff, they pick up bad words, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I, I mean, this is an empirical fact that I'm learning every day. <laughs> uh, and, and I think, you know, like from, from my daughter, I mean, not, not every day, but, you know, on a regular basis. And then there's the question again, like, well, how do we actually, you know, get that out of the system, right? And, and, and you know, I mean, that is, of course, you know, you know, raising kids or, you know, like, giving them feedback. Um, and, and I think, you know, once again, then there's a question to what extent can we actually like, you know, is, is there a way of, 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 of replicating that? And if so, what does it tell us about the human? And I think it's just one, one striking question, once again, just, you know, touting into the care uh, horn that I've been said before. One thing that is really important, what I find so striking about children is, is that they actually want to please, they want to be good. It's really, you know, it's like a really big deal to, you know, like, I mean, they care a lot about that, you know, to get like positive feedback and say, no, you've been good, or, you know, you listened today, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I think, you know, once again, I mean, there's a question to what extent this is actually like really important for, 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 for humans actually to pick up 
you know like good, good good behavior and you know to 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 get like a feeling for you know um you know like what is what is bad stuff what are bad things that you you know you shouldn't uh, you know like um you know you have picked them up but you know like get them out of the system so i think that's kind of i, I think a theoretically more interesting uh very interesting question um yeah and i have a question uh for Allison from her colleague, Jason Merchant. So I want to be sure to convey it to you. Jason asks, what are the prospects for machine learning systems to distinguish principled gaps in the data, such as syntactic islands uh, versus accidental ones? What grammars do humans appear not to even entertain while machine learning systems must? <laughs> I hope you understand the question because I, I was lost at Syntactic Island, but go ahead. Sure, yeah. So, so just to give a little bit of context for folks who are not, not linguists, the, um, some of the really amazing things about how humans learn language is that they are able to use the structure of language in ways that are not reflected in particularly robust or obvious ways in the data that they receive as input. And so this is, um, so there are extremely principled ways in which humans use the structure of language. And this is uh, really quite a, a marvel in terms of the way that, that, that human children manage very quickly to end up acquiring this. Um, now, in terms of the prospects for these types of models, um, this is, and I think that Jason was probably at, at Roger Levy's talk uh, recently, and may, I'm, I'm interested in, in knowing the, the, the thoughts of syntacticians on that talk. What we've been finding is that to a greater extent than we would expect, syntactic structure seems to be something that the models at this point finally, only recently, have been learning. Um, I am quite sure that there are aspects of syntactic structure and the hierarchical, hierarchical aspects of syntax and things that are not as apparent from the surface realization of syntax um, that the models are not matching humans on, but it does seem to a fairly convincing extent based on all of the tests that we've been able to throw at the models that they seem to have been picking up on a certain amount of abstract structure that more, more to a greater extent than we expected um, on the basis of the data that they're receiving. Now they are receiving orders of magnitude more input data than human children receive. And this matters um, because human children manage to learn this on the basis of much, much, much less language input. Um, but now that we've gotten to a point where we have models that are being trained on basically the entire input, internet rather, in terms of their input um, with, with billions or trillions of parameters, which Sanjay was, was defining earlier, um, they seem to be picking up on a certain amount of, of this type of syntactic structure, but they do not seem to be picking up on a lot of other aspects of the systematicity of, of, of how to map to linguistic meaning using that syntactic structure. So um, yeah, so, so there are definitely, there seem to be potentially truly fundamental limitations in the way that these models are learning and the way that humans manage to, what, what humans manage to achieve in terms of linguistic competence. Um, but but we do need to to acknowledge until we until we see see proof otherwise that we have been surprised by the amount of of abstraction structural abstraction that they seem to be picking up on at this point with all of the massive amount of of data and 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 parameters that they have. Yeah, I mean that's what's so amazing is that you don't know how it's working, but there are things that are, seem to be emerging. Um, anyway, I, I have another question I'd like to address to Sanjay from the audience. Um, and that's if Sanjay could expand a little bit on what he meant by simulation and the role of simulation and maybe link it back to the autonomous vehicle uh, problem or self-driving car problem. Good, A absolutely. So in any vehicular problem, right? Like I think that, I think that let's take a step back. The way that we described AI is fundamentally learning from patterns and data. Now, in any problem that involves collecting data in the physical world, like understanding when to turn left, understanding when to turn right, understanding how to control a robot to do something, there is, you're fundamentally rate limited in the amount of data that you can collect by the physical world. That's one piece. The second piece is you're also limited by the consequences that bad decisions might have in the physical world, right? That 
AIs learn from making mistakes in some sense, right? That means that uh, how do you sort of how do you sort of learn from signals that are going to be destructive in the real world, right? So increasingly in this this domain, we are interested in building little playgrounds, like computational play playgrounds, if you will, uh, that simulate many of the scenarios that a robot or a vehicle might encounter. And then there's an interesting question of how they sort of transfer those insights through repeated interactions at a much, much faster rate than you can ever do in the real world. And repeated failures, having catastrophic failures that you would never see in the real world, how could you learn and transfer those insights, right? Now, this addresses one class of problems, right? You can argue that by extensive simulation, you can catch more of that long tail, but it sort of pushes the pushes the buck somewhere else. Now the question, real question is the fidelity of your simulator, right? One, 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 th one thing that, one way that these have often been described, these, these new algorithms that learn from simulators have often been described as having the Midas touch. In some sense, they do too well on the simulator, right? That means that they can win at the simulator and they end up learning some of the bugs in the simulator as well, right? They learn how to exploit the bugs in the simulator. Uh, that's, that's, that's one one of the interesting one of the interesting situations here, but I think that simulation is going to be a reality for anything that involves learning how to interact with the real world, because again, real world is slow and real world has consequences. Right, right. I see that. So what you're saying is, in the metaverse, you'll never crash your Tesla, but <laughs> but don't uh, don't necessarily take that to the real world. Um, I have a question here. We don't. We have time for a couple more questions. There's one I want to address to to Malte, uh, which has to do with uh, John Searle. You know, the famous uh, Berkeley colleague and antagonist of Hubert Dreyfus. You know, the, these two powerful critiques of AI from completely different directions. And I, I, if I can sort of find the question again um, uh, to ask to address to you, uh, Malte, and get your view of it. Well, I, I can't find it again, but really, uh, I think the question has to do with, you know, the Chinese room argument, you know, that a kind of simulation is, is irrelevant, you know, you know, that AI, the, the whole program of AI is trying to simulate um, intelligent behavior is not uh, relevant. How would you react to that line of argument? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I'm, well, I mean, like, this is a, um, you know, like criticism of the Turing test and, you know, like how right. to read the Turing test is, is of course, uh, uh, you know, like a, a specific uh, question. I mean, there is, there are, you know, there are, uh, I mean, there's a huge literature on that. Let me, uh, I mean, just to point out, of course, you know, like the, the question whether, you know, there's always a question, something like, well, is, is, you know, like, if something behaves intelligent, you know, like, how does it actually make, I mean, that does it count as intelligence, right? And, you know, intuitively, it, it, it does not. Um, I mean, I think that there are, you know, like, very big questions about, you know, to what extent, you know, like the, the first description of the Chinese room is really, you know, like a good model of, the kind of task or the intelligent task that you know GPT-3 can do these kind of days. So I think there's a little bit of a question whether we still have such sharp intuitions about the third Chinese room as we have, um, you know, when we look at GPT-3. But let me just make I think one I think very uh, substantial and interesting uh, suggestion here in this context. Um, is that, well, you know, we might not only be interested in intelligent behavior, but it actually may really matter, you know, how this kind of intelligence is realized or manifested, as it were. And I think that's actually like, you know, the thought that interestingly, in response to the um, Searle's Chinese room, it, what the Churchlands were putting, pushing against that and we're saying, well, that's actually like, you know, why second wave AI is so much more promising because it's not only that we see their intelligent behavior, it is also that we're actually seeing that intelligent behavior kind of grounded or manifested or realized in a system that is very, um, that it, at least intuitively is very similar to the human brain. I mean, I think it's significant uh, about the, 
um, you know, like when, when when we talked about, you know, well, whatever works, works, and, you know, whether this is actually like how the brain is doing is another question. I think it's very, inter it's very interesting that the um, neural networks were originally inspired by insight into the how the brain is working right i mean and then the idea was well this is actually like you know our guide to intelligence or the guide to intelligence system is how we think the brain is working yeah so i think that uh, we will have to be you know, one possible re lesson you can draw from the chinese room is that uh, you know manifestation or realization matters and then you know i think we are back to the question that we had earlier to what extent do we have here, you know, like intelligence as it works in the human brain. And um, that is, I think, you know, um, one very interesting philosophical question about second wave AI coming out of the Chinese room. Okay, well, I we're just about out of time. I don't know if there's any parting comment or thought that any of the panelists want to make, Allison or Sanjay, I, we've, uh, about any of these topics. Um, yeah. Sure, I can. Uh, please, see. please give us the final word, <laughs> Allison, and then we'll have to. Um, uh, yeah. So I think yeah. So this has been really interesting. These are always very fun topics to discuss, and it's obviously a something that is is um, a really active area of discussion, both for specialists and outside of these areas of specialty, because AI has increasingly become a part of what what folks are interacting with in their daily lives, um, and so. I think that one of the really interesting ways that that we, especially as you know, folks who are interested in, in in humans and human intelligence, can engage with this and, and critically must engage with these areas, is in. I and this also goes back to the question about policy, um, is in trying to take these types of models, which, when presented to a layperson, uh, are very um, convincing. Right, so lay people in interacting with these models are, it, it, even, even specialists, it's very easy to be fooled into thinking that these models are more intelligent than they, than they are. Um, and when they're being deployed in situations that have high stakes um, implications, this, this, can be, this can be quite dangerous. And so um, I think that the critical role for folks who are, uh, who are humanists and who are, are, are intimately aware of what intelligence is in humans and what that ends up looking like is helping to define the standards and say, you know, this is what intelligence really means. This, these are the gaps between what these models are doing and what a human is actually able to do. And, and, and helping to clarify for people who are interacting with these systems where those gaps are and where you need to be genuinely very careful. We, a, a colleague was just telling me about how doctor, doctors have been using Google Translate when interacting with patients. This is, uh, this is potentially extremely concerning because you may, you know, those, the, those, those practitioners may not be aware that, that there are gaps in between what they're saying and what the model has produced in terms of the translation, especially for low resource languages that don't have as much data and the, and the translations aren't gonna be as high quality. So, so I think the, the, the critical role um, of, of, of the humanities, of many areas of the humanities is saying, what is it, where are those gaps? What are the standards that we need to be trying to reach? And in what ways have we not yet reached them so that the that people who are using these systems are able to use them uh, in, a, in a practical and safe way. Thank you. What a wonderful uh, wrap up for us uh, tonight. And I, I want to thank uh, all of the panelists for a very stimulating conversation. I learned a great deal. And um, I'm sorry that we had many, many questions in the Q&A that uh, wonderful questions I couldn't get to. But uh, hopefully we'll do it again sometime. And now I'd like to turn it back to the Dean, to Ann Robertson, um, to end the session. Thank you so much, David, for your insightful treatment of these very important issues. And, and Allison, Sanjay, and Malte, let me echo David in thanking you for sharing your knowledge and insights with us this evening. It was absolutely fascinating, I found. And finally, thank you all for attending tonight's Dean Salon. As I mentioned, this is our final salon for 2021-22. I look forward to seeing you all again in October for our first salon of 22-23. Uh, you'll hear more about it later this summer, so please stay tuned. And I hope you have a great evening. Good night. <laughs>